Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I want to make sure that we still have time for questions at the end, and we're running a little bit late. So I'm going to maybe move through this very quickly. If I'm talking too fast and you miss something, just raise your hand, and I'll uh, help you out. Uh, I'm the program manager of Affordable Learning Georgia. That's within the university system of Georgia. That's all of the college uh, colleges and universities that are run by the state within Georgia. So UGA is in there. Georgia Tech is in there, as is Valdosta State University, Clayton State University, Bainbridge State College, even an agricultural college called Abraham Baldwin. Um, it's a collaboration of very different types of institutions that all have uh, quite a bit of interesting stuff to contribute. And all of these slides are going to be uh, Creative Commons Attribution License, and I'm throwing that jargon at you and not expecting you to know exactly what that is, because I will be going through it very shortly. So we're going to go through why we're looking at textbooks in the first place, what open means, then what OER means, which is really easy if you know what open means, um, where you can find these OER, how we help with that, um, what Kentucky is uh, preparing to do, or you know the infrastructure that they have in order to make this happen here, and how OER implementation can help beyond just saving students money. So why textbooks? Well, the really big apparent problem in the textbook market is the same one that you'll see in the, pres uh, the prescription drug market, that it is what economists would either call a trust market or the principal agent issue, meaning that the person who is selecting the textbook is not the person who is purchasing the textbook. Um, that person has to put forth the money. The person who's selecting it may not even know how much it costs. Um, that tends to rise prices up more when you have a trust market. But it's not the only thing. Um, textbooks also are priced upward because of the same reason why uh, digital music was at first kind of in flux about how they should price their things. They were trying to price in the cost of piracy, the cost of people not buying the textbooks anymore. So the prices kept rising because people weren't going to buy as many textbooks. It was uh, an interesting time, especially at the advent of the kind of sharing internet around the 2000s, where textbooks were going to go. And apparently that uh, answer was up. Because here is 2000, and you can see that this is quite the turning point. Also, this is the consumer price index right here. That's uh, about three times the, uh, it raised up about three times the rate of the consumer price index. This is further up than the cost of healthcare has risen in the same period of time. And books and supplies are a big cost for students. The budget for books and supplies per year for a student, um, as estimated by financial aid offices across the country and assembled by the College Board, is about $1,298 a year, about $1,300 a year, um, which would be over $5,000 in four years. Um, this is the actual budget that if you went and got the day one materials that you needed for your course that you would be expected to spend. This is not exactly what students are spending. The National Association of College Stores have measured it and it kind of averages out to about $500 to $700 depending on the year that they're studying it. So there has been kind of a big argument in the open education world. It's like, well, are we underestimating it or are we you know, going with the college board? Is the college board lying? Well, no. What's happening is that students, because textbooks have risen up quite a bit, are avoiding purchasing the textbook. And they do that in many ways. First of all, they may just take your course and not buy the textbook. That's kind of the most common one. We'll see that around 60% nearly every time. 66%, this is the 2016 Florida Virtual Campus Survey um, in the 2012 and the 2010 one. The numbers were very similar. This hasn't moved around. 48% uh, reporting that they take fewer courses because they are pricing in the cost of the textbook. 26% uh, would drop a course when they see what the heck that textbook costs and they're like, no way, I'm not gonna do that. And 20% self-reported that they failed a course because they did not buy the textbook. Now this is self-reporting. We can't exactly measure why a student fails a course when they're self-reporting it, but they are saying that it at least did contribute to a lower grade. And I think at least that part of it we should certainly listen to. 
And this was about 22,000 college students that were surveyed in Florida. This is a really big sample size. Also, financial aid is a big deal. Uh, we, uh, about 30% of students that have financial aid are paying for textbooks with it, um, at an average of $300 per semester, which would be, of course, $600 a year. So basically, what they would usually spend on textbooks, that's what they're spending through their financial aid. Sometimes that's grants, and that's federal and state funding, and we can go into the ethics of funding these textbook purchases if we want, but there's also the student loans part of it, because financial aid includes both subsidized and unsubsidized student loans. And quite a bit of debt is uh, accumulating, as you can see. In Georgia, we've grown from 2004 to 2013, uh, 73% change among people who have student debt. So it has gone up 73% uh, to an average of $26,000. In Kentucky, it's risen even more. It's risen at 82%. That's because you started with a little bit less, uh, $25,000 on average for student debt. And if you think of, if you were going to get all of the textbooks that you needed to succeed over four years, you would have $5,000 of that being books and supplies. So textbooks are definitely not the only problem. Of course, we can talk about the rising cost of tuition, which has to do with the rising cost of labor and the rising cost of IT. But they are a problem that faculty and librarians and instructional designers can fix. So first, we need to know what open is before we get to what that fix could be. So here are the five R's. And the five R's are very important when it comes to open education. You may have heard of open access before, um, scholarly journals that are freely available to everyone in order to view them. And sometimes they are this open. But with education, we tend to focus on the ability to do a few things. To retain the content, obviously to keep it so that it's not just you can access it on the web, but if they take it away, it's gone. You can redistribute the content. So let's say that day one, um, you've got all of this right within your learning management system. You can download the textbook. You can view it there. It's ready for use. The students have absolutely no excuse to not do their work for the second day of class. Um, they can reuse the content. Uh, for example, let's say that you are a nursing student and you have a, an OpenStax Anatomy and Physiology textbook. You can put that on your tablet and have it as a reference source without a problem. It'll never disappear. There's no digital rights management to it. You can reuse that content. You can revise it. So let's say that you find a really good open educational resource, but you don't agree with what they say in one particular chapter. And this happens with commercial textbooks all the time. In commercial textbook land, you would have to contact that company and try to get them to change it through maybe an errata report or maybe a, a general argument for it. I had a music history professor who had lists of errata she'd send Norton every single year. And some of them got fixed, and some of them did not. Um, with open educational resources, you can go right into that file and you can make your own version of the content immediately. You will refer to the original to attribute it, but uh, you would be able to make your own version of it. You can make that fix as soon as possible. If you don't like the order of the chapters, if it doesn't fit your pedagogy, you just change the chapters and there is your textbook. You can also remix the content. Let's say I like, uh, well, okay. What if I had a McGraw-Hill textbook over here and a Pearson textbook over here, and I like their chapter three and I like their chapter four, can I just put them all together in a Word document and uh, send it to my students? Of course not, because they have the copyright. I'd be infringing on both of their copyright by combining these things together and sending them out. So you can remix open textbook content. So let's say that you had a biology textbook that had a really good discussion on the circulatory system that you didn't necessarily want within uh, your anatomy and physiology textbook. You don't like the discussion there. You can take that biology one, put it into the anatomy and physiology one, and you're good. That's what we mean by remixing. It doesn't involve turntables when we're talking about open education, <laughs> unless you're music production, in which case it might. By the way, this is, this is David Wiley's definition of open. Um, OpenContent.org is the site on the bottom. You can't see it because of the screen and because my link is a little bit too light. But if you go to OpenContent.org or follow David Wiley on Twitter at OpenContent, uh, you will be informed of OER and the theoretical background of it 
for days. It's, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of the founder of the new open education movement. If you follow him, you'll be keeping up with uh, the scene in general. So when something is available for free and it has these five R permissions, that's when it's open. So we talk about OER sometimes a little bit off the cuff and we talk about free stuff from Khan Academy, even though Khan Academy has sometimes some weird licenses where you have to put in this big paragraph about Khan Academy um, that may not be an open license or sometimes it's Creative Commons and it's totally fine. Uh, or you could talk about maybe a YouTube video that's free to view, but you can't copy it, you can't reuse it. It has to be contained within YouTube in that form. Those aren't necessarily open. They have to have the permission side of it uh, to, in order for it to be open. So when we're talking about OER, the quality of OER, the effectiveness of OER, make sure that you're talking about open resources that have those permissions along with being free. And how do we get those permissions? Well, we usually use Creative Commons in the open education world. Uh, we don't use things like open source licenses because we're not dealing with software that has a lot more to do with code and we're not gonna put stuff under the GNU GPL unless we are writing software. Uh, for Creative Commons, you are just looking at the content that you've created. So if you Creative Commons license something uh, to remix, to revise, and it's a PDF, you're not saying, okay, take the entire Adobe platform and remix it too. You're just taking your PDF and Creative Commons licensing that. And most of these apply to open education. Some of them really don't. So every single Creative Commons license has the building block of attribution. That is the foundation of Creative Commons. The idea that you have the permission to do this stuff with my resource so long as you attribute the original work and the author and link to it. That is the foundational element to all of these Creative Commons licenses. You can see by, 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 by. CC by is the attribution part. Um, after that, you're adding on a couple of different uh, restrictions. For example, attribution share alike means that if you create something using my content, you have to put it under the same exact license. Therefore, I am spreading the responsibility of freedom out to you. You also need to make this open and free. Um, attribution non-commercial would mean yes, so long as you attribute my work, you can do that, but you can't sell it. Now that's usually pretty clear, like I'm not going to make a commercial textbook out of a CC, BY, NC license. Um, when it gets a little weird is when you've got an open textbook and you want print on demand or you want to send it to Kinko's and get it printed out. Is that a commercial use? That's where it gets a little bit hairy. There's a New York case going on with a copy shop at the moment uh, about a Creative Commons non-commercial license. Then you can combine these together by NC and SA so that you would have to share it under that same license and you can't sell. Then there's this no derivatives thing. This works really well for artistic works where Creative Commons really started. Uh, it started with actual remixes uh, with Jay-Z and the Beatles where this DJ put them together, the, the black album and the white album to make the gray album. And so Creative Commons had music in mind when they did this. And you know, some people's artworks are very personal. They may not want you to make a derivative version of what they originally created. Or let's say that you're a scientist and you do some cancer research. You may not want somebody to you know, change that data around a little bit, even if they attribute the original work. No derivatives works for those, but it doesn't really work for open education because as you've seen with the five R's, you should be able to revise and remix the open educational resources that you have. This is very critical to pedagogy in a way that may not be critical to uh, having artistic license to do something. So uh, try to avoid licensing something with ND if you want it to be used educationally. You, you should invite that type of remixing and revising when you're making some sort of open educational resource. Then of course you can also mark it as public domain, that's CC0, that's no rights reserved. So the attribution part of it is also gone. It's I am giving this to the world, do with it what you will. And you can always go to creativecommons.org slash licenses and you can see 
the list of all the licenses there. They explain them very well. There's even a way to select your license based on what you want. Uh, so you don't have to memorize all of this today. There won't be a pop quiz. So what is an OER? This is really easy. If free plus 5R permissions equals open, open plus educational equals open educational resources. So anything that is open that you are using for the purpose of education is an open educational resource or an OER. Uh, so it's really important to understand what open means in the context of open education. Understanding what an OER is, it, it basically you just need to know what open is. And these can mean many things. It's not just going to be textbooks, open videos, open tests and quizzes, which are kind of scary because you're sharing them with the world. But you can do like a faculty vetting process for these where you can still copy them and remix them, but they're only going to send it out to a professor. Uh, OpenStax does that, for example. Uh, open lecture slides, uh, ancillary materials, the type of stuff that a textbook publisher might send you along with their textbook, even though most of the time those ancillary materials are not very good. Um, open images and photography, if you check Wikimedia Commons, there are plenty of those that you can use. Um, and open anything. Uh, if you're, You can use plenty of things to teach and we don't want to limit that within OER. We want this to be uh, kind of a medium agnostic term. So OER sometimes does refer to textbooks, but it refers to nearly anything you could use in order to teach. And this can help with our situation with textbooks. Um, we can provide an easy turnkey solution, a free and open option, instead of an expensive commercial textbook. So for example, if you have a good introduction to macroeconomics textbook, you can replace the $300 macroeconomics textbook that's already out there. In fact, one of the most expensive introductory textbooks is Introduction to Economics, which seems really weird, but that's, that is the case. So where can you find these OER? This is kind of the big question. The uh, Babson Survey Research Group, which surveys the, uh, basically the activities, the beliefs, the knowledge of faculty on open educational resources, have found that the three biggest barriers for them to put these in the classroom is to be able to find them, to be able to find stuff that is relevant to their subject, and to have like a comprehensive central catalog for all of these resources, which we don't. So finding the OER is kind of one of the biggest parts of this. So you'll want to start with the small collections first. You don't want to dive into the deep end and sift through uh, years and years and years of OER. Start out with the small ones to see if something fits, and then if it doesn't, then you'll move to the big ones. OpenStax College Textbooks is a great place to start. It's a great place to introduce your friends to OER because these are traditionally crafted textbooks. They're peer reviewed. Sorry about the microphone thing. Um, and they, they go through a process that meets a lot of the accreditation standards out there uh, for introductory courses. So they're a great place to start. The UMN Open Textbook Library, um, they are also the Open Textbook Network that started at UMN uh, with David Ernst, who's another really big person in open education. They seem to all be named David. Um, they have a great uh, open textbook library of resources that they didn't create themselves most of the time, but they're bringing them in, they're curating them, and then there's a post-production peer review system where people do kind of Amazon ratings for different aspects of the textbook. It gets really in-depth and it, it helps you kind of understand their lessons learned as they implemented the textbook. SUNY is another really good one, the State University of New York system. They've been uh, producing open textbooks for a while and they're producing open textbooks for any author that really wants to make their stuff open. So you get these really interesting niche topics or some topics that you may not have considered. There's an information literacy textbook on there that I think is really good. There's a mathematics textbook that uses a spiral pedagogy format. It's really neat. Um, so they're a really good place to check out for kind of the, the interesting, not quite standard uh, stuff. And then there's the Washington Open Course Library. Washington put together a bunch of open educational resources in the form of a course that could meet the basic requirements for one of their courses, especially within their community colleges. They put them all on Google Docs, and it may seem like uh, kind of a not 
flashy way of doing so because it's just a Google Docs folder when you go in, but they're also very editable because of that. So these types of open course materials can be the building blocks for you to make something very customized. Then you can move to the bigger collections. Uh, OpenStax has a system called CNX. They started out as connections slash CNX back in the day. And many um, faculty instructors, uh, old state initiatives, publishers, they put a lot of their stuff on CNX. It's not necessarily the best platform to produce your materials now, especially not natively, but there is quite a bit of content on there. Merlot has been around since the 90s. Um, they've always been into providing free learning objects to faculty, and they started out in the California system. Uh, Georgia was on board with them really early on, so we uh, have been involved with Merlot for a long time. Um, they, because it's been around since the 90s, if you do a search, you can get like really old uh, HTML documents with zero uh, style to them, no CSS. The links are all broken. I mean, it, you know, it's 1999. A lot of these sites went away. Um, but you can also get some great stuff from 2016. A lot of digital repositories harvest right into Merlot directly. So you can have this database of all this new stuff that's filtering in. Um, also, they have content editors and they have editorial groups for each uh, major subject area, which is really nice. Um, if you're interested in getting into OER, but you're not ready to like write a textbook yet, um, joining one of these Merlot editorial groups is a great way to get started. Um, OER Commons is another one. They are kind of K-12 all the way through um, higher education. So they are a catch-all in a very different way than Merlot. They're newer, so most of the materials there are going to be newer, but at the same time, they have a broader range of subjects. You can find a lot of instructional common core materials on there along with finding higher education stuff. So these are the bigger collections. This is where you go once you've already looked at the small stuff and said, okay, now I'm going to look at these gigantic fields of things. You know, kind of like if you're looking for library resources. You may start in your favorite database, and then after that, you'll go into some other databases within the subject, and then you may go to that gigantic discovery search to see if you missed anything. It's kind of the same way. And there are plenty of other options out there too. Open Courseware, so for example, MIT has a whole bunch of open courses that they've made available since, I think, 2004. Open access articles are a really big deal, um, especially if you're teaching a grad level course. Uh, Google Images, you can make a search and then click on search tools and usage rights and it connects directly to the machine readable versions of Creative Commons licenses. So you can search for reuse with modification and find these on Google Images. Same with YouTube, filters, features, Creative Commons. Uh, Search.creativecommons.org has, it's kind of a hub for um, different types of media. It's a great way to find images on different sites. Uh, it, some open music is on there as well. Um, Google searching can totally work if you just do like open textbook in quotes and search for a subject. Uh, be sure to also look at library resources. Don't worry about Galileo because you're not in Georgia. Um, and then no cost of, but copyrighted resources are also a thing you may want to consider. Uh, things that are free to supplement what you're doing. Um, we now have a repository for just open educational resources. This is focused on sharing everything from our programs, including our partnerships and our grants. And this is at oer.galileo.usg.edu. Galileo.usg.edu is our site, our regular Galileo site. We just put OER on the front of it. And if you've seen the University of Kentucky's uh, repository, it will be very familiar because we are also a B Press repository in the same way that they are. So it's the same format, although we've really bent the metadata to our will to make it just open educational resource focused. Right now we have 25 open textbooks in there. We have the collections of grant materials uh, from different textbook transformation grants projects. That involves their linked syllabus, their proposal, what they set out to do, all their outcomes, and their final report, which includes all of the research that they did on uh, effectiveness in the classroom. And then there are also some ancillary materials in there too, stuff that they created to supplement other textbooks. And 
the big hard truth here is that if you teach an intro level course, it's going to be really easy to find OER. If you teach a very uh, specific subject, so not English composition, but you're teaching something on Milton or Joyce, you're not going to find nearly as many OER for that as you would for the early introductory level stuff. That's because uh, philanthropy, foundation funding, they are targeting impacts. They want as many students as possible to be affected by their projects. So of course, the first things that they're going to target are the introductory level courses with really high textbook prices. So you'll see a lot of the STEM subjects and introductions to those STEM subjects as the first things that are targeted by OER programs. And so it, it will be tougher if you are teaching a graduate level course. But there's a lot more faculty created materials out there when it comes to graduate level courses. You may have made your entire course on Milton yourself. Um, I would then encourage you to make that stuff open and available so that others can see it also. So how do we help with this? Well, uh, one thing is that we partner with a university press. Hi, Leila. Um, we partner with the University of North Georgia Press. Uh, they had created a history textbook called History in the Making. It was for US History I. Uh, they started back in 2011 as a proof of concept, an idea that maybe we can make this open textbook with USG authors, peer-reviewed double blinds by USG faculty, and you know, meeting the standards that everybody needs to meet in the US History I course. And they did it, and they've got it up on, they had it up on their site for a while. Now it's hosted by us in our repository. And they were able to set the structure for creating open textbooks because of that proof of concept project. So we worked with them, and the online core curriculum organization, eCore, worked with them to create more open textbooks for things that weren't already covered within uh, places like OpenStax or the Open Textbook Library. So for example, Art Appreciation, we now have one. It, I swear this says more than just art on it, but it's a, it's a small picture. Um, there is a lab manual for introductory geology, which is very much needed, but something that isn't always covered out there. Uh, music Appreciation, World History One, World Literature, and an anthology of world literature for ancient stuff. Uh, obviously, an anthology for very new world literature is, is tougher to do because uh, it's not as public domain. All of these are CC by SA, which uh, if you want to quiz yourself right now, attribution share alike. So you can make stuff out of these books, and so long as you share it under the same license, you're good. And the UNG Press is really important here because, yes, as the subject matter expert, a faculty member should be able to share what they know with the world. And that's great, but there's also so many things that you need to take into account if you're making an entire textbook. For example, uh, are you going to require a team? Then, well, you're going to need to make some sort of agreement. So you'll do maybe a call for proposals, uh, a call for reviewers if you're going to do peer review. You're going to need contracts. You're going to need MOUs, those memoranda about understanding, those boilerplate documents to get people on board and say, OK, we're going to fund you for this work. Um, project management is a huge part of this. Not only do you have the authors, but you have the editors, and you have the peer reviewers. You also have the image people, and you have the uh, copyright management. So you have many different milestones and deadlines that need to be met. Project management is a big deal here. Um, editorial review, they have a system for that, and therefore it was very easy for them to take that on. They were able to bring together a double-blind peer review system for their textbooks. Uh, they do copy editing, they do production, they do graphic design, indexing, proofing. They had one person on staff for that art appreciation textbook just to manage all of the copyright stuff that they were going to have to deal with. Because if you're going to be showing a whole bunch of different images, even if they're Creative Commons licensed, they may be Creative Commons licensed photos of artworks created by somebody else. So they had to make sure that they had all their ducks in a row. They have like this huge index of copyright stuff at the back of it. It's uh, kind of beautiful when I'm thinking about it because I'm like this copyright junkie. Uh, but yeah, someone who is making sure that all of the copyright is in order. 
And then print on demands. They are able to do print on demand services. They are a university press, so they know how to do it. And they make sure that these are uh, compliant with accessibility standards, at the very least, the sections of things like the ADA uh, that have to do with educational resources, and the conversion of these to even more accessible uh, formats for uh, specific accommodations. We also have textbook transformation grants. Uh, we get a lot of questions of, why would you give faculty a bunch of money to change their textbook? Don't they already change their textbook? Well, yes, but the adoption of open educational resources and library materials and this curated content takes some extra time, as you'll hear um, in the next presentation. Uh, and this allows for a course release or extra workload compensation so that that extra work that you're getting done in order to transform your course, to transform your pedagogy, to bend these open educational resources to your pedagogical will, that all of this stuff can be done. We are ensuring that it is a successful project and one that you are not just going to drop as soon as you're done with the grant. Um, every single proposal references sustainability. They have a sustainability plan. Uh, they reference their future plans for the project, where they're going to present and things like that in their final report. So it is uh, a way to sustainably build a, a really successful OER program. And student savings are, of course, a big deal. If you're saving one student $200 on one course that they take, well, that seems kind of like small potatoes, even though it's kind of nice for that one student. But if you multiply it by 100,000 enrollments, well, that gets really big. We are affecting now over 100 and, uh, over 100,000 students per year through our textbook transformation grants program. That is based on faculty estimates of number of students per section, number of sections, number of sections per year. That's all calculated out after that, but it's all faculty reported. Um, and yeah, we are now saving them $16.6 .6 million a year just in our grant program. This doesn't even include our partnership with ECOR, which they have open textbook options because we are helping them fund that effort, and they are saving even more. We're going to be combining those numbers as we go along. And there's plenty of external impact, too. So the evaluation of these materials is really important. That's why I have those grants collections in the uh, Galileo repository. Um, measures for sustainability mean that they're going to continue. They're going to be updated. They're going to be you know, kept up. Uh, we have created materials even if you didn't have to create a new textbook. You may have some lecture slides that suddenly you're sharing. Uh, somebody made an entire set of coded web work problems. So web work is an open source mathematics program and they did these to supplement a calculus textbook. So we share all of the open source uh, mathematics problems and we also link to the GitHub page in which they're also hosted. Um, then there's you know the lessons learned. If I were to implement this again I would do this, 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 and this. Well great because if you're the faculty member reading that you just will take those lessons learned and move with them. Uh, statistics for retention and progression and graduation. We think that equal and day one access is very important to student success. Uh, we want to make sure that that happens. Uh, we are measuring it and for, you know, it, whether it helped or hurt or there were too many covariants to decide, it all gets in the final report. But there's also, uh, there are also some changes beyond cost savings to students that, this o that these OER implementations can do. Uh, first of all, they really recognize this diversity of ideas and thoughts. Um, some of the OER advocates out there kind of call this a, a choral method of instruction. The idea that you don't have just one singular voice telling you everything that you need to know about a subject, that you have multiple experts coming in. And you, know, you also have the voice of your professor through what they curate. So uh, uh, this is just one grantee who's talking about this. That one of the big things they notice is that these students who are education students, so they you know, would take notice of things like this, uh, liked that there were a diversity of resources, that it wasn't just coming from one point of view. Uh, it's also a sign that you are really engaged in their well-being, uh, you're really engaged in what they are doing. You are one of the only people who knows what their textbooks cost, and hopefully their textbooks cost zero because you've done that work. Um, it, it really kind of puts you on their team in a way. And you can see here 
Um, Seneca Vaught, who's great at this, way better than I would be at, at describing the like democratization uh, process that happens with this OER implementation, um, that this kind of thing happens. It's a sign that you're engaged. And of course, it's the reason for students to work hard. Uh, one of the first year experience classes that I uh, got to hear from when it was implemented at Georgia Highlands College, they said that the students came back to them and said, I really liked this because I had absolutely no reason to not do this work. And so therefore, I did it. And now I'm better for it. So thank you, even though I had to do a bunch of work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, having no excuse is actually a really good thing to do. I love this. This is a logic course. You've got a modus ponens over here with uh, two statements. If my logic class needs no textbook, then I'm happy. My logic class needs no book. Thank you, ALG. Conclusion, I am happy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, kind of another professor speaking to um, how customized it was for that course and how connected it was just to that course as opposed to a textbook that you kind of have to build around. And Kentucky is already getting started on this. Um, the UKnowledge repository, like I said, it has quite a bit of uh, similarities to our format. Um, and they have been providing access to University, uh, uh, University Press of Kentucky uh, books for now, mostly scholarly monographs, things like that. There are a lot of links to full text, uh, as uh, these are somewhat at cost books at the moment because we are just getting started on pursuing OER uh, with the University Press. So they have that infrastructure in place when, when they want to get started, so that's great. Um, OpenStax Chemistry has Allison as an author, uh, so that was really uh, good to hear. Uh, there are also seven psychology professors who are part of the NOBA project, which is a really nice open educational resources project in psychology that takes all of the all these modular things, like kind of sub-chapters, and puts them in kind of a website format, and you can combine them into your own customized textbook. And the uh, University of Kentucky has a copyright resource center, too, that talks about OER, fair use, even the TEACH Act. Uh, it explains it very, very well. I was really happy with that. So if you're out there, who, whoever wrote that, thank you very much. Uh, be sure to check out our site, affordablelearninggeorgia.org. I worked hard on it, so I want people to read it. Um, we have tutorials uh, that take you through finding and evaluating resources, uh, creating and hosting them, along with links to our top 100 courses uh, enrolled in the USG with links to OER for each of those. And nobody else measures the top 100 enrolled courses in the USG, so it's me with a giant Excel file doing that. Um, and we have our champions and coordinators listed. We have an advocate uh, for OER uh, who's a faculty member or administrator at every single institution. And we have a librarian at every institution who can assist with finding OER, uh, with writing those grants, with just everything that has to do with your implementation, hosting things in a repository, for example. So uh, be sure to check out our site because we've got this nice structure going on and I hope that you too can become a champion for OER. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions.